Good morning and welcome to North Lake Baptist Worship live stream. Thank you for joining us. We gather this morning because we trust in the Lord. In all our ways, we want to acknowledge the Lord Jesus for his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways and his thoughts are higher. So we gather to worship and bow down that the Lord may direct our paths at this time, our paths uh, keep us sheltered in our homes, but our hearts are still reaching out. As our church, uh, we've been sewing masks, providing meals, sending cards, and making phone calls. Um, we're showing the love of Christ who gave himself for us. So thank you, church, for staying on mission during this pandemic. Uh, in the coming weeks, we want to celebrate our mothers and those who are graduating uh, from high school, from technical school, uh, from college, or even graduate school. And so we're asking you uh, to send us a picture of your mother so we may honor her on Sunday, May 10th. And if you're a graduate, uh, we want to honor you on Sunday, May 24th. And who knows, we might be in phase two by then and able to meet on a limited basis. And speaking of, of that, uh, be sure to check out our website and the prayer chain emails uh, for updates at the, as our state uh, looks forward to opening back up. Uh, the website and our prayer chain email will be the primary means of communication uh, for updates and plans uh, as we look forward uh, to gathering once again on campus. Uh, church family, our giving continues to be wonderful. The Lord continues to bless here at North Lake uh, in, through our giving. And so as we worship uh, this morning, may we continue to be cheerful givers. You can continue to give online through our Facebook uh, page there on the Shop Now button. We'll send you out to our giving page or on our website and our uh, news banner. There'll be scrolling an online giving tab you can uh, click on or you can simply put uh, your tithes and offerings in the mail and we'll be sure to get that or you can stop by the office and drop it off. You know, uh, church, uh, John took part in a wonderful worship service uh, where there was a scroll that was unable to be sealed but then the lamb arrives and uh, is able to open the scroll and the congregation joins in a wonderful hymn and there they sing worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Will you join me as I pray? Almighty, most holy God, we bow before you, the living God, who is one but three, revealing yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for loving us. For in living, you loved me. Dying, you saved me. Buried, you carried our sins far away. In rising, you give victory. So as we worship, help us to place our faith in you, Jesus, our Savior. For faith is the victory that overcomes the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to have you join us today at home or wherever you are. Uh, I hope you're uh, enjoying your Sunday, and I'm glad that you've gathered with us to worship today. Uh, this morning, I want us to think about where our foundation is. Based upon everything that happens in the world, it's always good to have a check of where's our foundation and where's our belief in. And I hope you've put your firm faith and belief in the foundation of Jesus Christ. So I want us to sing about that this morning. Again, you'll have the words on the screen, so we want you to join in and sing out and worship the Lord, our solid rock. So let's sing and worship together this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sound. Oh, may I then in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone. Lord, lest to stand before the throne. Lord, Christ the solid rock I stand. receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and let us worship God accordingly to the reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. As we continue our time of worship today, I want this song to kind of remind us that we worship a God who is not shaken by recessions, not shaken by unemployment or worries or cares that seem to just rattle us every day. Rather, we serve and worship a God who is here, and he's ready to strengthen us as he receives our worship to him this morning. Psalm 18, verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, 
My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I pray God is your solid rock and mighty fortress this morning to sing and worship with us.
Thank you, Derek. Uh, I also welcome you to the House of the Lord this morning, North Lake Baptist Church, uh, and wherever you are out there. Uh, during this time we cannot meet in person, uh, I thank you for your continued attendance in our online uh, worship services and Bible studies that we're having throughout the week. I want to highlight a few prayer requests for you. Uh, you'll find our complete prayer list in the online bulletin, which is available at our website uh, under the online services tab. Uh, we want to start off today with a couple of praises. Uh, we have two birthdays for our senior senior members. Uh, Miss Wanda Parks, uh, last Monday, uh, was 97 years old. And also Tom Henderson will be having a birthday this coming Friday and will be 100. Uh, so again, as you have opportunity to uh, contact these folks, uh, send them a card or give them a call and, uh, and wish them the best in uh, this new milestone. Also, we praise the Lord for Annie Armstrong Easter offering for the North American Mission Board. Again, our goal was $10,000, and as of last week, we received $14,550. So again, thank you for being a missional church and a church on mission. Uh, we do have several prayer requests, if you'll look over those in your bulletin, but we did want to highlight uh, Dalton Holman again and all the folks from the National Guard who are out helping out with this pandemic. Also, for our uh, senior living folks, senior living, assisted living, nursing homes who are not allowed to leave their rooms right now, not allowed visitors, uh, so be in prayer for them, and if you know ways of, to be able to contact them, then in, in, do them and encourage that. Uh, also, I received a call yesterday from Joyce Tate, and her uncle, John Stringer, is in Northeast Georgia Medical Center uh, and has been diagnosed with this COVID-19, so be in prayer for him. And so, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with, this spring day. We thank you, Lord, that even when our world seems chaotic, that you are still on the throne and that your plan, your purpose, your promises are still true and ongoing. Lord, we do pray for the North Lake family. While we're not gathered together today, uh, all across the region, Lord, they're there. And we thank you, Lord, for them. And Lord, we look forward to the time when we can gather together again. We continue to pray for our leaders, for our president, for our governors, for all these medical advisors they have, that you would work in their lives and have your will and your way in their lives and ours as well. We pray for those who are sick, those who are bereaved because they've lost loved ones, for our doctors, nurses, hospital staff, and first responders who are on the front lines continuing to take care of folks who've been uh, stricken with this uh, pandemic. Lord, while we can't be together in body, we ask you to bind us together in spirit. And we ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
that y'all are giving him a standing ovation at home and uh, also in glory as well thank you brother terry and we do hope it is well with your soul i know our normal has been mixed up for the last several weeks and it's okay for our normal to be mixed up as long as our soul is not mixed up so we're hoping that it is well with your soul this morning if you have your bibles please open to second thessalonians chapter 2 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This week I thought instead of continuing our revelation study that we would study a revelation related topic. It's a question that I've been asked several times during the past month. Um, and the question is simply this Is this coronavirus a sign of the end of the world? Again, I'm going to go ahead and warn you this uh, sermon may be a little longer than normal because this is one of those that continues to get bigger the more I study it. Uh, but nevertheless, under the current uh, situation here, if it gets too long, I guess you can always turn it off at home. But we hope you won't. Uh, we hope you'll stick with us to the end. I think the best place to answer this question about this coronavirus being a sign of the end of the world would be to go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, talking about the rapture of Christians, gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, 
either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I was still with you? I guess back in 1 Thessalonians. I told you these things. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness, I think King James says, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. If you underline things in your Bible, underline that phrase there because that's what we're going to work this morning. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of this lawless one is according to the works of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness and deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, what the Apostle Paul here is referring to is a question about the end times. Apparently, some teachers were coming to the church at Thessalonica, uh, spreading rumors that Paul had written a letter to somebody saying that the day of the Lord had already come, and they missed it. Well, needless to say, uh, they were in a panic. So Paul writes to them in verse 3, and assures these believers that the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, judgment day, had not yet happened. Paul says that Christ will not return until a couple of things happen. First of all, in verse 3, it says there is this apostasy, the falling away as you see there. Uh, the gospel will be preached throughout the nations, as Jesus has said, to people around the world, and many will receive this gospel. But then following the reception of the gospel, there will be a falling away. People will begin to reject the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. And once the people reject the truth, the world will be wide open for the big lie, the great deception of the one called the Antichrist. And we see him there in verse 3. That's the second thing that would happen. In the last days, this man of sin, this son of perdition, verse 8 calls him the lawless one, will appear. This is the same one that the Apostle John calls the Antichrist. And according to verses 9 and 10, this Antichrist will be empowered by Satan. He will be the master of deceit. He will perform lying signs and wonders. Verse 4 tells us this Antichrist will oppose God. Of course, the Greek word for oppose is anti. So he will be anti-God, anti-Christ. He will exalt himself above God. He will deceive people by sitting as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul received this insight into Antichrist by meditating on the words of Jesus who warned us before he went to the cross in Matthew chapter 24 that in the last days before his second coming that false teachers will arise. People will begin to denying that Jesus is the Messiah. Instead, uh, they would tell the world that they are the Christ, that they are the anointed one. They are the ones sent from heaven. They are the ones with all the answers to man's problem. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said, False Christ, false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, and they will deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. So even devout believers, if we're not careful to stick close to the Word of God, can be easily deceived. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus refers us to an earlier prophet, the prophet Daniel. And he tells us when it comes to the prophet Daniel, we need to read and understand. Daniel gave us a description under the Spirit of God of this final world superpower and this final world ruler who will appear at the end of the age. You don't have to turn there. You can research it a little later, but I'll zip through Daniel very quickly here. Daniel chapter 2, the Lord gives him the big picture over history. He said in the history of the world, the history of humanity, there will be five great superpowers in history that will rule over the known world at the time. The first is pictured as the Golden Empire. This would be the Babylonian Empire. The second is the Silver Empire. That's the Persians. The third is the Bronze Empire. That's the Greeks. And the fourth is the Iron Empire. That's the Romans. If you notice as I went through there, as those kingdoms get cheaper as you go along. You go from gold all the way down to iron by the time you get to the Roman Empire. 
course, after the Roman Empire collapses, there will be many nations that will try to rule the world, and none will be successful. And we've seen that during the past 2,000 years of history. Various empires have tried to get going, but could never quite conquer the world. But there will be a fifth and final world empire made up of remnants of the Roman Empire, what we call the West, our Western civilization. Something will come crawling out of the Western civilization that will try to put together this final world empire. It'll be a one world government which will appear at the end of the world. It will be weaker than the other empires because they're going to try to build their new world order by mixing and mingling the various ethnic groups around the world is what Daniel tells us. But try as they might, he said, they're not, they're not going to be able to unite the various nations of the world. He says it's going to be like trying to mix iron and ceramic. They will not unite. They will not stick together for long. And, of course, this final world order will appear to be strong, but it will be fragile, easily broken, and it will be terribly broken with the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in judgment. That's Daniel 2. We'll move on to Daniel 7, and Daniel describes this final world ruler, the Antichrist, and he calls him the little horn. And, of course, horn in the Old Testament re represents power. In the animal kingdom, the bull or the buck who has the biggest horn usually dominates. But he said this Antichrist is going to be a little horn. He's not going to be as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Cyrus the Persian, Alexander the Great, or Julius Caesar the Roman. No, this Antichrist will be a little horn who's going to boast, Daniel says, pompous words. He's going to be a big talker. He's going to claim to be bigger than God. He wants to get rid of God. And he's going to be changing God's holidays, God's culture, customs, and laws. We move on to Daniel 8, and we get another look at this Antichrist. He said he will have fierce features. He will look big and bad. He will be powerful, but Daniel says, but not by his own power. In other words, he's not going to be the great warrior king that we saw in a Nebuchadnezzar or, uh, or a Cyrus or an Alexander or Julius Caesar. He will use schemes. He says he will be a manipulator. He will deceive people. Daniel says, through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his rule. This Antichrist will be a diplomat. He'll be a politician who will manipulate himself into power. And then Daniel chapter 11 says, this Antichrist will not conquer the world like the great warrior kings of the past did. Daniel 11:38 says he will conquer the world with deception. And through the philosophy of a God, his ancestors did not know the God of money. He will conquer the world with gold and silver and precious things. Now back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This final world ruler, this Antichrist, will not conquer the world by the sword with armies fighting from continent to continent uh, like the kings of the old days. He will take over the world by deception. He will deceive people. He will use lying signs and wonders. He will use propaganda, pompous words. He will deceive people. He will use money to manipulate and control people. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 that I referred to a few moments ago, this mystery of iniquity, this mystery of lawlessness, Paul said was already at work. Yes, even in Paul's time, in the New Testament era, through the last 2,000 years up to our present time, as Jesus said, there's been wars and rumors of wars, and the stage is being set for this final one-world order, which according to Revelation 13... When this world government is prepared and put in place, Satan himself will be, in, be enthroning and empowering this person known as the Antichrist. So yes, this mystery of iniquity is already at work. And as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 8, the anti-Christian forces will be like birth pangs on an expectant mother. These movements will increase with intensity and frequency as we get closer to the end, as we get closer to the big day. Daniel chapter 12, he says that in the last days, transportation and information will increase. And of course, we've witnessed that during our lifetime. Uh, thanks to computers, we can process more information than ever in the history of the world. Paul agrees with Daniel in 2 Timothy 3, 7. He says, in the last days, men will always be learning, but they'll never be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we've watched this mystery of iniquity in our time. For at least the last 100 years, billionaire bankers and businessmen have been trying to sell the world on a one-world government. After World War I, they tried to establish the League of Nations, and that failed. 
and then after World War II, they established United Nations and have dumped billions of dollars into it trying to build their new world order, and we're almost there. So do I think that the coronavirus is a sign of the end of the world? I don't think so, but I do think this COVID-19 is a drill. It's a simulation. It's a dress rehearsal, if you will, to work out the bugs and get all the nations prepared for this final world government. For the last three months, we've watched our globalist leaders manipulate us with the Marxist revolutionary technique known as the Hegelian dialectic. It's a very complicated philosophical thing, but it can actually be salted down to about three points, and that is called problem, reaction, solution. The way you change cultures is using problem, reaction, solution. So these globalists, they cause a problem, be it terrorism or pandemic or global warming or whatever they want to come up with. And then they wait for our reaction. Our reaction as people tends to be the same. Oh, no, we're all going to die. Somebody do something. And then they have the solution, a prepackaged, ready for us, usually involves more government control of our lives. So let's look at the timetable a little bit. Sometimes it gets blurred with our 24-hour uh, news cycles that go through, but let's look back at the timeline and see the changes that have occurred in the last couple of years that's brought about our current predicament, which for us began on March 15th when President Trump declared a state of emergency for coronavirus. Three years ago, November the 8th, 2016, Donald Trump shocked the world by winning the presidency of the United States of America. He won this election by promising to make America great again, to put a stop to the globalist agenda, to close our borders, and to quit paying all the bills for the United Nations and NATO. Also to stop uh, this man-made global climate change hoax and to stop the one-sided trade deals. He said, I want international trade, but it needs to be fair trade, not with America always being on the other end of the hook there. So once he started all this, immediately the globalist billionaire banking and business class turned on him. The press attacked him. Democrat politicians and never-Trump Republicans began trying to impeach him. That went on for about three years. And then once that failed, the next move was coronavirus. Now in the past, it was usually David Rockefeller who was pulling the strings on, around the world on these globalist movements, but he died in March 2017, we never did think he would, but he died in March 2017 at 101 years old. And of course, then there's George Soros. He always gets the blame. He's 90 years old. Right now, he's not having much to say, but he is heavily invested in pharmaceuticals. And so it appears that Bill Gates is taking the lead of this billionaire's club move toward a one world order. Uh, one of the other elder statesmen of this bunch is Henry Kissinger, who is now 97 years old. And ever since I was a little kid, Henry Kissinger has been on the radio and on the TV talking about his new world order. Anyhow, he wrote an op-ed piece on April the 3rd rejoicing about how this new world order would lead us to, how this coronavirus would lead us to this new world order. So he is so proud of Bill Gates, he said there. So apparently Bill Gates is the anointed one. He is one of the richest globalists today. He's co-founder of Microsoft, who is now working to give away his nearly $100 billion fortune through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His pet projects are population control and vaccinations. His father was a board member for the abortion provider Planned Parenthood, who helped young Bill understand as he grew up the need for global birth control to save the planet. Vaccinations, strangely, by Bill, are considered a subset of population control. Bill has this theory that if less babies died in infancy, then parents will want fewer children. And so he works all this population control and vaccinations through something called the Good Club. You can look it up on the internet. The Good Club is made up of other globalist billionaires like George Soros, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey, uh, the Rockefeller family, uh, the Ted Turner Foundation, etc. Two years ago, on January the 17th of 2017, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, for those of you that's not aware of what goes on in Davos, Davos, they have this January meeting every year where 3,000 of the world's wealthiest people gather every year to figure out how to rule the world. Bill Gates, back in 2017, initiated a new working group called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. It's a collaboration of the Gates Foundation the governments of Norway, India, Japan, and Germany, and two big pharmaceutical companies, 
called Inovio and Moderna. They also included DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as the Mad Scientist of the Department of Defense. They also included the Army, U.S. Army's Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, that's the Mad Scientists of the Army, that work out of Fort Detrick, Maryland. This CEPI began working on the next epidemic in 2017. Also at Davos, Gates began working on a Netflix video called Pandemic. Now, as y'all all, all know, I don't watch movies, but maybe I should have watched this one. It was released in November of last year. The plot of the movie was a coronavirus that originated in a wet market in China, leaving millions of people dead. Wow, what do you think? Is that a coincidence? Is Bill Gates a prophet? Or is it a plan? Last fall, October the 18th, 2019, there was a pandemic exercise called Event 201 at Johns Hopkins University. The exercise was conducted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and Michael Bloomberg's School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And yes, that's the same Michael Bloomberg that just tried to run against, Bill, uh, against Donald Trump for President of the United States. The pandemic simulation predicted that the coronavirus would have the same kill rate as the Spanish flu of 1918, which caused around 65 million deaths worldwide in an 18-month period. It's also interesting to note that Dr. George Fugao, the director of the Chinese Centers for Disease Control, was involved in the simulation. At the same time, at the very same day, October the 18th and lasted through the 27th, the World Military Games were being held of all places in Wuhan, China. You had 10,000 athletes from 110 countries. Uh, the United States delegation was about 300 people. Two months later, January the 7th, China reports the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan. January the 21st through the 24th was the 2020 annual World Economic Forum gathering in Davos. So the rich guys were back in Davos again in January of this year. And Bill Gates and his CPI, uh, CEPI that I just announced, they announced a coronavirus vaccine program with partnerships including Inovio and Moderna and the United States National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is led by none other than Dr. Tony Fossey, who is now the chief medical advisor to President Trump, who you see on TV in these daily briefings that we're getting. He's an interesting character because he wrote in March in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine that this coronavirus was going to be a nothing. It was going to be similar to the seasonal flu. But when he went, to tele went in front of the television cameras, he told American people this coronavirus is 10 times worse than the seasonal flu, may kill 2 million Americans if we do nothing. It still may kill 200,000 Americans even if we shut down the country and shelter in place. There's no known vaccine, he said, and it's going to take 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine even ready for trials. Of course, the question is, is, where did Dr. Fossey get all those numbers? Where did he get the model of the 2 million people and 200,000 people? Well, it turns out that came out of the University of Washington, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Before the thing was over in Switzerland, we had something going on at the United States Capitol. On January the 24th, United States House of Representatives began drafting a coronavirus stimulus bill called the CARES Act. Yes, the money that you got this past week and deposited into your account actually started the legislative process on January the 24th, which as Americans, we didn't even know there was such a thing as a coronavirus till March, but somebody knew. So somebody in Congress knew it well enough to know that we were gonna need relief, and they started a bill back on January the 24th. By the way, January the 24th is also the same time that the Senate was getting an ultra-secret briefing about this, and our new Senator, Kelly Loeffler, all of a sudden started having some changes made to her investment strategy on Wall Street. January the 30th, the United Nations World Health Organization officially, uh, officially launches a worldwide public health emergency for what they called a novel coronavirus even though at that time there was only 150 cases in the world, nevertheless, they knew it was going to be an emergency. By the way, novel means newly discovered, means never seen before, uh, means COVID-19 didn't just come crawling out of the woods. Kind of makes you wonder, where did it come from? 
January the 31st, President Trump orders a travel ban on anyone traveling from China. Four days later, January the 4th, the Centers for Disease Control decided not to use the World Health Organization's COVID-19 test kits. They didn't think they were good enough, that we had to come up with our own. So CDC made their own test and they were defective, had to pull them all off the market. CDC got out some new tests by the end of February, but then there were backlogs taking one to two weeks for people to find out whether they had it or not. By the way, you may not remember this about my resume, but before the Lord rearranged my life, I was planning on being a doctor. I was a pre-med major at the University of North Georgia, North Georgia College, majored in biology, minored in chemistry. So I went to the CDC website and looked at those test instructions, see what all was involved in doing a coronavirus test. And listen to this, this is a quote from the CDC website. A positive COVID-19 test does not rule out bacterial infections or co-infections with other viruses. Even COVID-19 may not even be the definite cause of the disease. Still, report all positive cases to CDC. Now, in layman terms, what that means is a patient may actually be sick with seasonal flu, or pneumonia, or PD, something else. Molecule of COVID-19 DNA in their swab of their throat or their nostrils, then you're gonna report that to CDC as a positive case. Well, one of the things that does for you is it definitely pumps up the numbers to make sure that everything that happens out there in the medical field is a COVID-19 case. Well, anyway, uh, the next day, February the 5th, Donald Trump was acquitted on the charges of impeachment. So all this time, we've been watching news about this impeachment, and we knew nothing about this COVID-19 thing that was going on out there in the world. So March the 11th, um, World Health Organization officially declared the COVID-19 a global pandemic. March the 14th, the Associated Press announced volunteers in Seattle were given the COVID-19 vaccine. Wait a minute. That was made by Moderna, where we heard that name before, and it was approved by Dr. Fauci's National Institutes of Health. And wait a minute, that's less than two months. I thought Dr. Fauci earlier said it takes at least 12 or 18 months to get a vaccine ready for trials. So something's going on there. Anyhow, March 15th, President Trump declares a state of emergency in the United States for COVID-19. And that's when we begin the social distancing, setting six feet apart, standing six feet apart, no, we no meetings with over 10 people. On March 30 31st, Bill Gates wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying the United States missed the opportunity to get ahead of the coronavirus, so we need to shut down the U.S. economy for at least 10 weeks, which would take us to the end of June. And a week earlier, Bill Gates did a TED Talk interview where he said that once people of the world learn to trust science to solve a pandemic, maybe they'll be ready to trust science to solve climate change. And it kind of makes you wonder, where are we going with this thing? And so now we've moved on in our television narrative. Now the narrative is who done it? Where did this COVID-19 originate? Chinese leaders are saying that the United States military who attended the World Games in Wuhan released it as a bioweapon against China. American leaders are calling it the Wuhan virus and saying that the Chinese released it out of their virology lab in Wuhan in order to affect the world. The truth is probably up in there somewhere. But the trouble is, it's classified. And we will not know the truth for 40 years until it's declassified. And at that point, I will not care. Bottom line, this novel coronavirus, COVID-19, is a manufactured crisis designed to deceive people to accept a radically different world than you and I are used to living in. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't go out of here and misquote me. I'm not saying that people don't get sick with coronavirus. I'm not saying that they don't even die with it. The only thing I'm saying is according to the Centers for Disease Control who keep up with all these diseases, in an average year in the United States, there are 39 million cases of flu. 39, that's 10%, 39 million cases of flu, and between 30 and 60,000 people die. And I've been living on this planet for 63 years now, and we have never shut down the U.S. economy over that big of a threat and that many deaths. But here we are, for some reason, the powers that be have chosen to shut down America 
over COVID-19, which we've already said they're cooking the books on it, but right now they've only got 70,000 cases against 39 million cases every year uh, between flu and COVID. And also today they've got it jacked up to 35,000 deaths, but still that's considered a low flu year. So once again, why did we shut down the economy? I believe we are being deceived and manipulated. And the question is, is why are we being deceived and where are we going with this? Well, according to the prophet Daniel and the apostle Paul, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. We're watching people who have been deceived by Satan because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and they're changing Christian customs, culture, traditions, and laws all across our land to prepare the way for a future Antichrist. I don't know if he's right around the corner. I don't know when the Antichrist will appear, but nevertheless, the stage is being set. And we've seen a lot of changes just in the last month. As Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago and former White House chief of staff under President Obama used to say, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And brothers and sisters, they're not wasting this one. We have watched our leaders transform this COVID-19 coronavirus from being just another virus into a crisis, into an epidemic, into a public health emergency, into a global pandemic. Now, I want you to stop because, again, we get caught up in the day-to-day, 24-hour news cycle, but stop and think about all the changes that we have accepted in about a month's period of time. We'll start off with the first thing they had to do, and that was to verify the power of the press. Make sure that those five corporations that control 90% of what we see and hear in the media still have the ability to put everybody in a panic. And of course, we're talking about CNN, Time Warner, ABC, Disney, Fox, News Corp, CBS, Viacom, NBC, Comcast. These networks bring on experts whose job it is to convince us that we need to give up our liberty or we're all going to die. They bring on globalist experts who explain that global problems require global solutions. I've heard that a half a dozen times, uh, sometimes daily. They tell us the world is too complicated for any nation, even something as great as the United Nations. We can't fix this by ourselves. We need a one world solution to our problems. They bring on experts who tell us that we need to quit being ignorant and listen to science, listen to the experts, listen to the technocrats. They alone know how to fix pandemics. They alone know how to fix climate change. Another one of the great changes that we've seen that I've never seen in my time is called social distancing. Six feet between individuals, no gatherings larger than 10 people, order people off the streets and confined to their homes. This is a trial run at martial law, but it turns out they never needed martial law because most Americans submitted voluntarily. But governors have ordered up police, deputized government workers, and deployed National Guard just in case we the people get sick and tired of this and rebelled. And to further add to the rumors of a police state, our governor in Georgia set up a telephone hotline so you can call and rat out your neighbors who are not complying with lockdown orders. That sounds more like Russia or China than it does the United States of America. The next big change is crashing the capitalist economy. Following these social distancing guidelines, we have watched 22 million Americans lose their jobs. We've seen the stock market drop 10,000 points. We've seen our retirement savings vanish and go down the drain. We've watched the government take charge of the means of production, which is a classic definition of socialism. We've got the government using executive orders, loans, and grants in order to pick which businesses will win and which businesses will lose. Another big change that's come out of this is they've made the church irrelevant, or should I say more irrelevant than what we already were. In times past, when America went into a crisis, they would call the people of God to pray. That's not what we're hearing now. We're hearing we need doctors, we need scientists, we need people to tell us how to do this. We don't need God, we don't need churches in prayer. Churches are listed among non-essential businesses. Pastors are not allowed to visit sick members in hospitals or nursing homes. The Christian tradition of handshaking with the right hand of fellowship is forbidden. Churches are not allowed to assemble, which is a violation of our First Amendment right freedom of assembly and freedom of religion. Not to mention it's also a violation of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, which says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Our sermons and our Sunday school classes are forced online, which means that all of our words are being saved and stored in the National Security Agency's new and huge data center in Utah. 
which as long as we have a government that's okay with Christianity is okay. But what if our new world government is more like China? Then our very own words will be used against us in a criminal trial. So NSA, if you're listening, there it is. And so now the government is offering free money to churches. Never mind the fact that using taxpayer money to prop up churches who are in debt is a violation of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. As our Minister of Music, Derek, often says, with the shekels comes the shackles. Whoever takes government money will ultimately take government regulations. And I don't think we want to do that at North Lake, at least not on my watch. Another change, cashless society. This is one of the globalist dreams and has been for years to get rid of cash, use digital currency to be able to monitor and control the flow of money around the world. Korea, which was one of the first nations outside of China to be infected with this disease, they pulled in all their cash to sanitize it because the World Health Organization said cash was just crawling with coronavirus. They required all their people to buy their things with credit cards and their iPhones. In the United States, Speaker Pelosi's first corona uh, relief ha house bill called for using digital dollars in order to give people their money that went out last week. Of course, you remember the Democrat House bill didn't pass, but the Republicans modified it, and they did pass a bill that didn't have digital dollars in it, uh, but we're already seeing pushing it through the IRS. There was all kinds of problems. We had money going to the wrong people, going to the wrong banks. Had some fireman, I think, here in Hall County got $7 million check last week. I mean, it, it, was, it was strange, I guess, just to prove that it's not going to work that way. So now we have a Senate uh, subcommittee on banking that's working on the details of how to give any future money to Americans in digital money instead of cash. Speaking of government giving out money, one of the goals of this New World Order is universal basic income, where you get paid to do nothing. You don't have to work for money. The government decides what you need. I guess giving $1,200 to every adult and $500 to every child was a good test run. Interesting article in Bloomberg News on April the 5th. Spain is using the coronavirus crisis to roll out its universal basic income system. So apparently some of our nations know what's up with this. As Trump was signing in the $2 trillion re relief bill, he said that the final cost of all these programs will probably be $6 trillion. Now, brothers and sisters, this may sound good for us to be getting all this free money, but the thing you got to remember is no such thing as a free lunch. It will come due at some point. I believe by the time we get to the November elections, our national debt will be over $30 trillion. And just the interest on that debt will take up 15% of our federal budget. Think about that. 15% of your tax dollars will be going to empower international bankers who are holding our debt. Now, I could go on, but look at the hour. So let me conclude with another little notice change. This one happened around Christmas in December the 23rd, 2019. Uh, the prestigious Scientific American magazine reported that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, had developed a biometric tattoo where a nanochip can be injected into your forearm at the same time you're being vaccinated. Therefore, your arm can be scanned to reveal your identity, your vaccinations, maybe even your medical records. The biometric tattoo program was part of a bigger plan called ID2020 that was also announced this January at the World Economic Forum in Davos, again sponsored by the Bill Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and several other billionaire organizations. These compassionate billionaires advertise this as being a special tool to help poor little children in undeveloped countries where in a crisis when there's a war or famine or something like that, they have to run to some other country and you don't know, they don't carry papers with them, so you don't know whether they've had their shots or not. So all they got to do is scan their little forearm and know whether they've had their shots or not. Sounds very compassionate. But then you read on down the article, they also mentioned that these tattoos would be a great screening tool for people at airports, border crossings, schools, health care facilities, government buildings, and sports facilities. Brothers and sisters, 2 Thessalonians 2.7, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Now, I know, uh, for those of you that are still watching by television and haven't turned it off yet, 
uh, one of my, after one of my conspiracy theory prophecy sermons that I do from time to time, I'm often asked, well, Brother Danny, well, what can we do about it? I mean, you, you know, you preach a sermon to scare us all to death. Well, what can we do about it? Are there some politicians that we can call to stop this thing? And the answer to that is I don't think so because I think this train left the station a long time ago. The real question is not what can we do. The real question is going to be what will you do? If this coronavirus makes its second or third wave around the world like the experts are predicting, and the Bill Gates vaccine is magically ready, and they offer you the vaccine, but in order to get the vaccine, you also have to receive the biometric tattoo. Will you take it? If not, you probably won't be able to go to work or to school or the grocery store or to the bank. In the grand scheme of things, it'll probably not be a non-Christian thing if you accept that tattoo, a vaccine tattoo. We'll probably be okay. But later on, if we carry out this philosophy to Revelation chapter 13, when it's not just about a vaccine, but when you're required to swear allegiance and be willing to worship the exalted leader of the United Nations, or whatever the name is called at that point, to prove your loyalty to the UN, then you must take this biometric tattoo. And if you don't take it, then you won't be able to buy or sell or travel or get health care. What then? You're probably saying, Danny, I think this is a little extreme. I don't think this can happen. Sure, it can happen. It's happened before in history, even in some non-techie times. In ancient Rome, under the Roman Caesar Domitian, who happened to be in charge when John wrote the book of Revelation, he forced people to offer a sacrifice once a year of incense. It was just a little pinch. It wasn't much incense, just a little bit. All you had to do was pitch it into the fire and say, Caesar is Lord. That's it. And you're a good Roman citizen, and life goes merrily along. But that was a problem for some folks called Christians. They refused to take the pinch of incense and pitch it in the fire, and they refused to say, Caesar is Lord. Instead, they said, Jesus is Lord. And they and their families were thrown to the lions or given some other horrible punishment. We'll talk about that more next time when we talk about Sardis, the persecuted church. Is this coronavirus a sign of the end of the world? I don't know. But I do know that we're 2,000 years closer to the end than when Paul wrote to us about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. My prayer for me and my prayer for you is Ephesians 6.13. That is, Lord, help me. Lord, help my North Lake family to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. To stand up, stand up for Jesus till he comes. As we close, let me ask you, are you saved? You know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior and Lord? Is he Lord of your life? Next question is, are you alert? Are you paying attention? One of the things that Jesus told us before he went to the cross was to watch. It's because this thing, all these things are going to happen in an hour when you do not suspect it. Behold, I come as a thief. Are you putting on the whole armor of God? Are you in the Word daily? Are you praying for strength? Are you preparing yourself and your family for some difficult days ahead? Because as the Apostle Paul warned us, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. I encourage you this morning in closing to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never prayed to receive Christ, never repented of your sins and asked Him to come into your heart and save you, won't you do that today? If you've been saved but never joined the church and taken that first step of obedience, being baptized, won't you make that commitment today? Maybe you want to join our church and find your place of service. You can make that commitment today. Maybe you have some need in your life and you just want somebody to listen to you and pray with you about what's going on in your life. Won't you do that today? You can do that by calling our church office number, which you see on the screen, 
888-7338 and I or one of the staff members will be standing by to answer your call and talk with you. So just simply call that number. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord, we are overwhelmed by our circumstances these days. We're also overwhelmed by the truth of your word that you knew our situation long before we ever knew who we were. Help us, Lord, not just to be hearers of the word, but doers, to, to act on it, to stand on it. Lord, help us to be strong, even as the mystery of iniquity is already at work around us. Help us to be strong and faithful to you. We do pray, Lord, this morning, if there's someone out there under the sound of my voice that's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day that they put their trust in you. For for all of us, Lord, I believe it's later than we think. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. 